Elizabeth Town Council. It is Wednesday, October 13th, 2010. Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Here. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Walsh. Here. Thank you. Would you please join me in the pledge? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Is there anything that uh, the councillor would like to update us on? Sarah? Uh, last Thursday night, October 7th, uh, Jessica Sullivan and I attended the um, thank you dinner for the volunteers at the Portland Headlights for the, all the folks who work at both the museum and the gift shop at the Higgins Beach Inn. And um, it was really delightful and, for me, very eye-opening. There's an entire room full of people who give up their Sundays and their afternoons and to go to, the, to both the museum and the gift shop and to greet the visitors who come off the buses and in the cars and they're incredibly knowledgeable and interested and passionate about it and again and again at least the people at my table said you know we get more out of this than they do and they told stories about people who would come and had some connection to the museum and how they would make a relationship and people come not only from all over the country but all over the world so um, it's a really, really nice event, great feeling to it, and I just wanted to repeat once again how much we appreciate all the time and energy and knowledge these people put into basically greeting visitors that come to our town. Um, and they all seem to be a very cohesive group um, that got along so well, So, and I guess that's thanks, special thanks to Jean Gross for being leading them all and organizing them. So thank you once again to all those volunteers. Great. Thank you to you and to Jessica for attending. I was sorry I had to miss it due to another commitment. I've been before, and it's a great group of people um, who deserve a lot of thanks from the community. So thank you. Anybody else? A report? No? Okay. Um, we come now to the first opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. If there's any citizen who would like to uh, speak, please come forward to the podium. Seeing none, we will move on. I will ask uh, the town clerk to make a report, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought it was appropriate, since it is election season, uh, to give everyone an update where we are on voting, particularly absentee voting. Uh, also, there are several questions, frequently asked questions, of voters, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to share that with everyone. Um, first of all, the question that, that, believe it or not, we do get is, May I vote on election day? <laughs> do I have to vote? I, we do. Do I have to vote absentee? I prefer to go to the polls. There are several groups out there pushing for absentee balloting, and voters are getting very confused with that. And they call up or come in and say, can't I go to the high school on the second? They say, yes, we would prefer and love to see you there. <laughs> so again, we will be at the high school gymnasium Tuesday, November 2nd. The polls are open 7 AM to 8 PM. Uh, if you are a voter and you choose to vote absentee, absentee balloting is being conducted here at Town Hall in this room. We'll reset it when we're done tonight. Uh, Town Hall is open 7.30 to 5 on Mondays, 7.30 to 4, Tuesday through Friday. So again, this is set up if you uh, prefer to vote absentee or if you need to register to vote, you may do so here or at the polls um, on Election Day. Um, we have many questions. Folks ask if the voter list is evenly divided. They seem to think that they're the only ones standing in long lines at a certain time of the day. Um, actually, years ago, we used to put articles in, in some of the local newspapers on the counts um, by voter list to show them that it really does come out evenly. So I just thought I would share that again, that they do come out um, as evenly as we can get them. Um, a question that we have had lately because of um, the school board election specifically, uh, there are two seats available for council and two for school board. You'll see when you get the ballot, there's only one candidate on the school board. So we've had a lot of questions um, surrounding that. So I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, one of the questions folks ask is, 
If the ballot says that there are two candidates and I only want to vote for one, may I do so? Will this discount any other vote that I have made? And no, it will not. If you have properly voted your ballot, which is filling in the oval on candidates that are on the ballot, or say there are on the state ballot there are four questions, say you only want to answer three, that will not discount the remainder of your ballot. And I think that that's an important point. We get that here when people absentee ballot, and we get it a lot at the polling place. I've only answered three of the questions, not four. That is fine. Specifically in regard to a writing candidate, and again, this would not be just for this election, but, but any election. The first thing that you need to do, like you do for a regular candidate, is fill in the oval next to the name. What that does is it shows the voter tabulation machine that that is the person that you want to vote for. In the case of a write-in, you have to go one step further and write a first and last name. So again, it would be filling in the oval, writing in the first or last name. And again, with particularly again talking about the school board, if you only want to vote for one, whether it's a candidate on the ballot or if it's a write-in, or if you want to write two write-ins, you may do so. Fill in the oval, name, first name, and last name. The other question folks ask is, what if I don't spell the name correctly? Let's take the instance of a first name. If, if somebody has a name that they might be Patricia or Patty, they will take either Patricia or Patty. The last name obviously has to be the last name. If it's kind of a difficult name to spell, if we can tell the voter intent, is that name, and they've got some form of the first name, and particularly if it's an announced candidate, we will count that, okay? Where it gets a little tricky is if somebody has a different first name, but the same name of a candidate that has announced, we may have a, another voter with that name. We have an instance where there is a writing candidate, I believe, and, and their last name is not the only last name. There's several people in town with that last name. So that could get tricky. And it could be that somebody actually voted for another person, not necessarily that announced right in. So again, we look at it, we, we be reasonable. We always look at that if, if this was ever taken to the next level to the court of law, would it be reasonable that we counted or not counted a certain ballot? Voter intent, we can only go so far. Can't read minds, but we certainly can do a reasonable uh, job in determining if it was a particular candidate or not. But for a write-in, you have to also have the oval filled in Absolutely. next to the name that you write in. Yes, right. and what that, thank you, what that does for the voter tabulation machine is it says, okay, this is the candidate. It also puts it in a separate bin that at the end of the night, we have to look in that bin to see if they're writing candidates or maybe ballots that the machines just couldn't read for some reason. So again, that in the case of a write-in will direct that ballot into that other slot and we will hand tally it for that, hopefully just that race um, at the end of the night. Um, the other question that we've had is, will the school board results be available that evening, the evening of the election? I, I don't know. Um, my sense is that there are going to be a tremendous amount of write-ins, whether they're four announced candidates or not. Again, I'm afraid that some people will think that they have to um, uh, vote for two candidates, you know, a candidate on the ballot and a write-in for any of their votes to be counted. So we're trying to get out to the public again that as long as you vote the other ones properly, you don't have to vote for two if it says two. Um, so my sense is, I mean, we could have, a, I anticipate a few thousand voters and we could have just about as many in that right bin. I'm not sure it's reasonable to ask staff to stay till one, two, three in the morning to count ballots. I'll know better during that that day how things are looking and, and so forth. So I just, um, I know it's gonna be hard for folks, but I, I think, you know, it's still staff and human beings, you know, um, that have to stay that late. And some folks just don't function well after midnight or whatever, I just, you know, <laughs> so I'm not sure. And would the quickest way for people to find out results be to look on the website? Yes, absolutely. I've already uh, touched base with our wonderful webmaster, Wendy Derzewick. She's going to wait up. 
for whatever results that I have that evening. And so we've already alerted the local newspapers and so forth and any interested uh, residents to be sure to look to the website for those results. So, so, so they don't have to, if they don't have to call town hall right. the next morning yep. Yep, looking for right results. There. They'll, and we'll also announce website. we'll also announce that night if the the counting of of the municipal ballot um, will be the next morning too. Okay. Are there any yeah, questions? I have a, I have a question, Deborah. What about town hall on election day? Can you? Right, Michael and I uh, talked about it um, today. In fact, in at the June primary, we experimented with closing um, the tax office, the town clerk's office, um, for election day. Uh, we just find that we need the staff on election day at the polling place and it's hard to staff this office and the polling place so Michael and I decided that um, November 2nd we will be again closing the town clerk's <coughs> office and the tax office for this staff to be uh, down to the polling place to help us out on election day. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Jim? Uh, Deb, um, can a person mount a sticker campaign? No. And what is that against the, basically these would be stickers that someone would affix to the ballot right. and then fill in the bubble but be very consistent in terms of the spelling of the person's name. Yep. It used to be um, years ago stickers were allowed at primaries. And at that time, at least in Maine, we didn't have the voter tabulation machines we do now. When we um, started to get the voter tabulation machines. We got our first one in 1987, along with Portland and South Portland. Um, the stickers jammed the machines. So can't uh, but they were never uh, not allowed for municipal um, anyway. So. Okay. Thank you. So if I don't know if anybody, I have no idea because I haven't been following it closely. But if anybody did have a sticker, they shouldn't put it on the machine. I mean, on the ballot. But they might want to look at it for, if, sure. I don't know if any candidates are passing out yeah. stickers or not, but they might want to look at it for the correct spelling okay. of the Thank name. You. And can they carry the card? I mean, it's a difficult name. Can they carry the card in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They just, it, and if I may, one more thing. Um, for, there's a little bit difference now with a writing campaign for a state or federal office versus a municipal. The state law now is that if you are a writing candidate for a state office, you actually have to announce that and there's a process to go through. And actually at the end of the night, um, we only have to tally that number of those announced write-ins. And that write-in we can actually post at the polling place. For the municipal election, because those laws did not, do not apply to Title 38, which covers the municipal, um, the, if there are any announced writing candidates for no matter what office, council or school board, for instance, or Portland Water District trustee, mm -hmm. those will not be posted at the polling place. It is a, conceived as a por form of um, influencing a vote. And I did triple check that today with MMA Legal. So, you know, just to make sure that law hadn't kind of gone over to the municipal side and not been announced. But, so any writing candidates for municipal elections will not be posted. As election officials, we cannot share that. We can't give first names, last names, whatever. I have another question. Um, if candidates are standing, you know, outside the polls, you know, how people sort of traditionally stand out there, if asked by uh, a citizen, can they tell them what their name is? They can tell them what their or name is. They can tell what their name is. They cannot, the trickiest thing is, they can't tell them what they're running for. So, good morning, my name is Deborah Lane. Joe Citizen says, so what are you running for? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Well, if you're on the ballot, say, announced candidate or a state writing candidate, you can say, well, these specimen ballots are there and they can kind of direct them. But the tricky thing for a municipal writing candidate is their name will appear nowhere um, in the polling place. So, good morning, my name is, well, what diff, you know, what are you running for? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Usually at that point they direct um, the folks to us, which is fine, either myself or the election warden, and we tell them the same thing, I'm sorry, we can't tell you either. So. Okay, uh, and does that also mean then that candidates can't hand a sticker out, <laughs> card out? Correct, there's no, there's no literature. Um, no literature within 250 feet of the polling place. 
can they wear their own campaign button? No campaign buttons. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. Only a, a voter can if they're only coming um, to and front, you know, just to vote and then leaving. If they kind of hang around and kind of check out what's going on and whatnot, they would have to take off their button. But anything, anyone going to and from, they can wear their button no more than three inches, um, just coming and going to vote. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very thank much, you and, and thank you to your staff um, who worked very hard on our action. So pass look on. forward to the results. Okay, town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Chair Swift Kata. A, a couple of quick things. I, Wendy Derzewick, in addition to being our very capable webmaster, is also our cable TV coordinator. And she has asked us at all of these meetings to remind everyone to speak into the microphone. Uh, we've had instances of folks ha almost to the back of the ramp trying to speak into the microphone, and it, it just doesn't catch. So you're encouraged to move the microphone down to the proper place. And you know you can move it back if you want afterward, but uh, really try to make sure that uh, the microphone is picking up. If you notice today, I think part of the concern of that is a little echoing in here. Maybe it's because uh, we don't have that big an audience either, but uh, uh, you know, sometimes they have to turn the, the mic up so much it then causes feedback in the system. So uh, we're hoping to keep the sound down and to keep the, everyone speaking to the voice. Any questions on that? That's an easy one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Second, I, I just wanted to mention we were very fortunate uh, last Saturday to have 200 uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth show up at the uh, Sperling Church Open House. And Deborah and Janet had prepared for that. And, uh, they were, it was really good to see so many citizens interested in that, uh, in that particular project come in to see the church and to, uh, and you know, 98%, no, 99 percent of them uh, were very happy with, with the results and what they saw. Uh, so it was, uh, it, was, it was good to see so many folks interested. Uh, did want to mention two things coming up this weekend. The police department is having a, another prescription medical drop off. Uh, it's posted on some signs around town, the information's on our website, but it's, it's really important to take, get rid of unused drugs in a proper way so they're properly disposed of, and the police department's offering that opportunity, I believe it's between 10 and 2, drops off, off at the town center fire station. Uh, also, this coming weekend, the Friends of the Arboretum at Fort Williams are having an invasive plant removal party. Uh, and they'll be down at Fort Williams Park on uh, Saturday morning. Again, there's information on our website about that, but uh, if anyone uh, is interested in learning about invasive plants to the point of seeing the best way to remove them and uh, wants to donate some physical labor, it's, uh, it's a good chance to get out and meet some of your, your fellow community members on Saturday morning. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Uh, next, we will review the minutes of our September 13th meeting. Do I hear a motion, please? I move to approve the minutes of our September uh, 13th meeting. Thank you. I second the motion. Okay, any corrections or changes <coughs> or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, next is our first item on our formal agenda, item number 113, which has to do with Fort Williams Park. Michael, did you want to introduce this? I, I, uh, you want me to do it? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, the town council had a workshop about a week ago, I guess, uh, with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission as well as with the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. And one of the issues that's been identified with Fort Williams Park is that there's many different ideas for different uses at the park, but the master plan really deals mostly with maintenance and not, not how to accomplish accommodating a lot of the different uses that, that are being talked about. Uh, th there's also you know, issues involving trails and how do they connect and some other issues. So it's suggested that uh, the town council consider appropriating funds for an update to the master plan. At that workshop, one of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission members also suggested uh, that the that you might want to have a business plan done for the park. And we have very rough estimates of those options. Uh, option one would be to appropriate 40,000 
to the Fort Williams Capital Fund from the general fund and designated fund balance for an update of the master plan and to develop a business plan for the park, or option two would be 25,000 just for the master plan. Obviously, uh, the option three is take no action, and you could have an option four, which is to do the, the business plan and not the master plan, and that would be uh, approximately 15,000. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Dave? I move that we appropriate $40,000 to the Fort Williams Capital Fund from the General Fund undesignated surplus for an update of the master plan and to develop a business plan for the park. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Okay. I, I, it's more of a question. I've made the motion, uh, but I still have a question about whether these two uh, studies or developments of plans or amending the master plan ought to move forward simultaneously. We had a bit of a discussion about that at the workshop, and I'm not sure exactly where I come out. Uh, certainly on the business plan, we've been hearing about all kinds of revenue raising ideas for the last few years. And I think it does make sense to get a, a real business plan going, uh, but I'm just wondering as to the timing, what people think about that. Jessica? I would be in favor of um, having a business plan either before or concurrent with the master plan because um, there are so many ideas that have been put forth by uh, many, many citizens uh, that I think a business plan would prioritize um, money-making entities that might be the most successful and viable at the park. And so uh, I would be in favor of of doing that at least with, if not before, a master plan. Okay. Other comments? Right. I have a question. I mean, tip, business plans I've seen are usually constructed after there's a basic concept of what you want to do, and you, you <laughs> and you you say this is sort of what I want to do, and you have bring a consultant in, and you say, does it make sense? Can you look at all the factors that I should be considering? You know, what are the rates of return? A whole variety of things. Are we suggesting here that we engage a consultant and say, look at the park and give us all the ideas you have about what businesses might work here? I, mean, I, I, I guess I want to know if we're going to narrow this down because it's the sort of thing where if it's not very specific and we're not very detailed, we're not going to get something that's very useful. The, the staff recommendation is, is that you first, uh, through the Fort Wayne's Advisory Commission, we, we contract with a, the master planner. but as part of that process, as we see how that's evolving and questions and issues that come up, that we, we engage someone to do the business plan as well based on some of the issues that are coming forward. So they would really work in concert together. So almost concurrently, but you know, it's, sometimes the business plan might be a little ahead of the master plan, sometimes the master plan a little, little ahead of the business plan. So what we're doing here is authorizing the funds to be available. Do we then have the ability or authority to say whether or not we want this specific business plan undertaken or study undertaken? Or who's going to make the decision that they go ahead with it? If, if you appropriate the funds, the assumption is, is that the assumption that staff has is that you'll want a, a product back that is both a master plan recommendation and a business plan that accompanies that, that come back to you at the same time. And along with some dialogue along the way, updates as well. Penny, I agree with what I, I agree. I agree with what with the way Mike is positioning it. That it sometimes the master will be ahead of the business plan. But what I would uh, suggest is that we have kind of trigger points or check-in points. Don't go for. Uh, six months without a, okay, what's going on with the master plan? Okay, what's going on with the business plan? I think we might want to stay a bit closer to uh, the happening. So maybe what we say is, yes, let's forge ahead, but we want to have a, uh, a monthly or every other the month update as to what's happening on the master plan and the business plan. That would be my thing. Okay. Sarah and then Jim. Just for the sake of clarity, especially for the, any citizens watching, I think if I were a citizen out there, I'd be wondering why it's going to take $25,000 to generate yet another plan for this park when there seems to be hundreds of pages that have already been generated of ideas, needs, cost estimates, even engineering studies. Even I'm a little uncertain about exactly what they're going to do for $25,000. 
Does anyone know? Do you want to I'd be happy. Why don't you, Jim, go or first Jim, and I'll take Jim, the question. Well, before that, that answer, um, the, my, my sense about this is that we meet once a month as an advisory uh, commission, and this will be a, an agenda item and reported against whatever the outcomes are or whatever the results are. And those minutes would then be provided to you, to this, to this board, and uh, you'd be kept abreast of every stage of this process. Um, I think the business plan, I think, has been one of the discussions within the commission about how do you implement something, you know, and what is the cost-benefit analysis, and is it, in fact, something we ought to be doing? Like the wedding venue has been tossed around and discussed in various forms, and um, I think that the concern is that are we applying the right sort of assumptions, the right logic, and are we in fact going to spend our energies and resources, and what is the payback? And ultimately, I think that's where the business plan becomes a, a more a more practical execution of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so. I think that it was good that that came out in the workshop because it has been sort of out there and um, it has been discussed in, informally, but I was glad it came out in front of the group because it clearly needs to be done. Can I, Jenny? I just want to respond to Sarah's question. My position would be <clears throat> if you allocate, if we appropriate the $40,000, I really believe that the business planning process is going to be more costly than the, um, the, kind of the master planning process because the master plan is going to be an update. I don't think, and it could come out that that full amount of money isn't even spent, but when you go back to Jim's example of uh, that we need to do cost benefit of wedding venue, blah, 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 it's like there's many different ideas out there that the CBAs need to be done on. And that is where you want a good person who understands how to do a good cost-benefit analysis is going to be delving into each one of those yeah. and, and, and then and understanding how the master plan needs to be altered in order to implement that business plan because we have to make changes within the fort to implement some of those things. I mean, my, my vision would be that there would be a model provided to us that we would then on a go-forward basis use for any other alternatives or suggestions that might be made two years from now so that we have something that we can actually hang our hat on. So I'm looking at the business plan as being sort of a, a you know, short-term, mid-term, but long-term it would be good to have a model that also has a financial side to it that we could actually apply to anything that's suggested in the park. Because who knows, two years, three years from now, we may have something presented that no one has even considered at the moment. Um, Frank, and then Dave. So just to be clear, are we, are we going to tell the consultant that these are the five businesses we're serious about, give us, give us a business plan, or are we going to go to the consultant and say, give us analysis on all of the different business plans that have been proposed? What, what, what are we expecting to get back? I just, I'm not clear about that. My, my question was pretty much along the same lines as Frank. I guess I had the assumption that we would perhaps identify the, the top ideas that the commission thought would be consistent with what they want to see at the park, uh, but that we would certainly invite that consultant uh, based on his or her knowledge of revenue producing ideas or ventures in other parks in New England or elsewhere that they may say, well, have you also considered X, Y, and Z? So I think it would be a combination of both. It wouldn't just be a blank slate, but we would provide ideas, but also ask them to give us ideas in return. But I don't deal with these types of consultants, so maybe the town well, manager for, for those, I'm going to ask Mike to address this in a second, but for those folks who are maybe watching on television, um, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has developed a list of their ideas, their thoughts, their priorities for revenue enhancers or producers for the fort, for the park, um, but they did so within certain limits, parameters of, the, of the, the current use policy and the current master plan. So I agree with you, there may be a few other things that the, uh, the business plan person 
uh, consultant might want to look at that, for instance, and I'm not suggesting we're going to do this, but one of the current use restrictions is no alcohol allowed at the park ever. And if you're going to have a wedding venue and a wedding reception venue, you know, you might want to let them consider a wedding venue with alcohol or something. Not, I'm not saying we're going to do this. Just I don't want people to think that that's where this is going. But um, I do think that they should uh, look at other ideas that they might have. I mean, that's the value in, at, in uh, asking a consultant to do sort of a, a broader look. Um, Frank, did you have something? Yeah, I'm sorry for these detailed questions, but are we, are we also looking for sort of a true business plan in terms of implementation steps, timing, a financial model, and the whole thing, or is it more of a conceptual thing we're going to get back? Mike, do you want to address that? Because you came up with the dollar estimate. Yeah. You know, the, the dollar estimates are rough estimates. Uh, you know, I, I think all of the, the questions I've heard and all the concerns I've heard certainly have validity, but, you know, but that's why you do a master plan and a business plan. We don't know the answers to, to all these questions yet. We don't know what's going to come to the top that we might want to do a more detailed business plan on that we can go up and get up and running. And there's been talk about concessions there forever, but I, I, you know, we, we haven't really coalesced around a model of how concessions might work. You know, how is it going to be run as a business? What's the town's role? What's the, the private sector's role? Uh, if it is a private sector role, you know, what, what should they be able to get out of it based on the knowledge of the traffic there? What, you know, how does the town uh, make money out of it? If there's, if, there's a, the, if there's a wedding chapel, you know, how will it be operated? Or I shouldn't use the word chapel, a wedding area. How will it, how will it be operated? Would it be best for the town to operate it? Would, be, would it be best to get a, a private sector operator? Uh, and, and again, how would, how would you set it up? You know, that, that's what I envision. And you know, in going back to the, you know, Sarah's question on the master plan, you know, one of the issues with all of these different type things is you get to where are they going to park? Because if you go to the park the busiest times, the parking spaces as they now are quite filled, uh, how are you going to handle uh, sewerage disposal, you know, septic tanks? Uh, you get into issues if you're looking at siting different things, of you need borings, you need uh, all these different issues. You need someone to put together a plan that actually shows, once you exclude all the shoreland setbacks, all those issues, what, have you have, what do you have left? Uh, how, how are you going to service these type things? That, they're nice to have, but you know, in, in any area that's as beautiful as Fort Williams has the potential to be, with the potential to the, these things, you've got to have a plan of how, how you're going to uh, reload, restock, uh, all these different issues. And, you know, I, I, I don't know the answers to all, most of your questions yet. Uh, that's, you know, that's what doing the plans is, is all about. But what I, I'm sorry, but what I hear you saying is, in response to Frank's question, is the business planning should take it to a point where we know what needs to be done in order to implement any, an aspect of that. Not the detail steps, but what resources do you need in place to make it happen? Do we need to hire a person who's uh, responsible for organizing weddings? I'm not saying that we have to, but it's like, to me, the business plan should take it to that point. What resources do you need in order to make it happen? That's what I hear you say. Oh, yeah. on, on that point, uh, uh, Penny, I agree, I agree with you, but I also go back to the point you made earlier in that we need to keep coming back to the town council to do exactly. a, a reality check, and I think that reality check will help determine how far into what detail a business plan goes for certain aspects of the plan. Because you don't want an implementation plan. You know, right. Not if I, it's something the council I, we hear then doesn't want to do. I think the, yeah. one of the key points was what Jim said uh, with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission reporting regularly. This is going to be sort of an iter iterative process, back and forth, back and forth. The, the council is the policy-making body on the fort. Um, everybody else's, rec all other bodies are recommendation-making. And so we'll sort of see how far we get. And then we may want to pursue certain avenues further. We may, when we hear a partial story, 
we may want to block off certain avenues. So we'll, we'll go from there. Frank. Just my Jim. final point. This may be semantics, but I think to, this suggests to me that what we're really looking for is a scoping study, not really a business. A business plan implies a lot of detailed implementation steps. I think, and I, I say, I make the distinction because I think if we really can get a business plan, that's going to be the next step after the scoping study, which probably means more money. Um, uh, and because we do need a scoping study to really figure out what the <laughs> parameters are of what we can do and what can be done within the context of uh, whatever revamp of the plan is for, for, the, uh, for the park. Two, two points. If, if that's where we go with scoping, this body needs to understand that, that the scoping would come back to you for a decision. Mm -hmm. The actual plan implementation which is the detail, won't necessarily come back to this group because that's going to be left to administration right. or to some other methodology, whether it's to subcontract it, to have an actual facility manager, whatever. So, so I, I believe that if we take it to the 50,000 foot view, bring it down to 20, which is scoping, that getting down on the ground is going to be at a very different level. And I'm not sure that this board is the board that will be dealing with that. I, will, I would feel that the commission would be the group that is going to be working through all those elements. That's the way I view it. Again, the, the council is the policy right. setting. Right. So that's at a, at a very group. different level than the actual on the ground. But it's definitely not yeah. implementing all the details. Yeah. Mike. But, you know, if we do have any lease agreements that's or, a, that's or a, a business arrangement, that will come back to the council. That's big enough to be policy. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. Um, how will the consultant or consultants be chosen and by whom? It's a good question. There's a, there's a meeting tomorrow morning of a subcommittee of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission that's reviewing a, a draft scope of services for the master plan. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission two years ago, a year and a half ago, went through a whole process of interviewing consultants for a project they had then, but also for a consultant who would work with them on projects as they came up. And they, they selected one particular firm that they wanted to have a continuing relationship with so they weren't always re-educating a new firm every time they wanted to do something. The, the plan would be is to take that scope of services, and, to, and my understanding is is to go back to that firm and to see if a, an arrangement can be negotiated once they agree on, on what the scope of services would be. It's not something that's on the master plan that's being planned to opened up again to every firm that might be interested in doing a master plan because they already went through this, they already went through that process of deciding a consultant they were comfortable with and they respected their work. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing what I think is consensus, please shake your head no if, uh, if you disagree, um, on that the idea of the business plan is more the scoping kind of business plan and not the detailed nits and nets and implementing kind of business plan. So I, I don't know if we need to ch change the motion at all. I don't think so, but everyone let it, let it be reflected. It'll be reflected on the tape and then everybody's understanding that it's a scoping kind of thing. So um, maybe the wording should say up to 40,000 just to. I would accept that uh, suggested amendment. It, Mike, is there anything we have to do <coughs> appropriation wise? I mean, when you appropriate, do you appropriate a certain amount? But I'm just asking technically, but with the understanding that my we don't have to be spent. I'm trying to tease out, not saying okay, it has to be 25 on this and 15 on that. Yeah. It's just, it's just. Yeah, it was. There was a reason why it was. I didn't spell out exactly how much for each one, although since there were competing motions, you could almost tell about how much we thought there might be. But uh, you know, I, I would prefer there be a set amount because I can see different projects coming along as a result of this. And once you, you know, it's just easier to transfer money to a fund once and yes. set up a budget for a purpose than to keep drawing as you move along, particularly when you're involved in <coughs> separate funds. But uh, that's really it's up okay. to the okay. But it's up to the council. If you want to do that, that's well within I, I would the agree. And I think Sarah just said it was it's fine. Or so. uh, okay. Okay. It's, it's been moved and seconded. 
Uh, all in favor of option one, the motion. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Excellent discussion. Thank you for everybody's contributions. I especially want to thank um, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and also the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. They had someone participating in this workshop um, uh, a few a couple of weeks ago. And I want to thank Councillor Jim Walsh, who is sort of our, our point person on the council who uh, deals with Fort Williams. And I do want to also thank Bob Malley, who staffs uh, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and has a lot to do with the fort. So, so thank you very much. Okay, moving on, we have item number 114, Appointments Committee Recommendation. Penny, you are chair of appointments. Yes. Could we hear from you, please? Okay. First of all, uh, once again, I'd like to say that um, I'm constantly amazed at the amount of talent we have in town and the people who apply for uh, the openings. It, it's just... Um, Amazing, and it's a very, very difficult task to um, determine and hone in on who we would recommend for an appointment. So I, I really want to encourage um, people who have applied for uh, openings on boards and commissions over the last um, year to um, submit applications for the upcoming openings because. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of talent out there. We're recommending Aaron Grady to be appointed to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. And um, I, I really think Aaron's uh, energy and her uh, history of, uh, I guess, how she has been involved in the fort as a, uh, a user with the fort from the time she was a, a young child to now. Um, I think what she will bring to the fort and how we're uh, talking about transitioning that will be um, a fantastic addition to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. So we are recommending Aaron to be appointed. Okay, so we'll, I'll take that as a motion. Is there a second? <coughs> Jessica? I'll second the motion. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Appointments Committee. And I do want to encourage citizens, so the, the, as Penny mentioned, the time is coming up very rapidly when the Appointments Committee will be very busy uh, looking at applicants to fill in all the boards and commissions slots that are opening up on January 1st, so please apply. We need your help. Um, item number 115 has to do with a lease. Michael, you want to just introduce yes. this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce Greg Miles, who's sitting here with the greenish shirt and greenish tie. Uh, Greg is the new facilities director for the Cape Elizabeth School Department uh, and also has responsibilities looking after some of our municipal buildings. Uh, it, this particular lease is for a, but it's only 160 square feet. It's a real small portion of the, the building that's in front of the community center. It's the, the Edward Jones office. And, and there's also an upstairs, which, which Greg has advertised, and a, in a back area uh, that we're also looking at uh, to, to also potential lease. This was last occupied a couple of years ago uh, by a mortgage company that subsequently uh, went out of business. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a big amount of a, of a lease amount, but again, it's bringing in revenue. The revenues from this building go to, uh, to the community services uh, budget. It goes to that particular fund. Uh, it was particularly fortunate that Greg was coming on new to do this because the, the, the potential tenant is, is a person in a, a, actually a law firm uh, with whom I potentially have a future conflict of interest uh, but don't have one now. Uh, but nonetheless, it, I felt it was inappropriate for me to be negotiating with this individual uh, at this point because there is a potential future conflict of interest. So anyway, Greg did all the negotiating and if you had any questions, uh, he, uh, he would be the one to answer them. Uh, but it's a fairly standard commercial lease that he's come up with. And you did get a revised one uh, by email today and was also at, at your place. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, is, are there any questions? Before we have a motion, are there any questions for Greg? 
Hearing none. Thank you. Is there a motion? As long as David? Uh, I move that we authorize the town manager to enter into, on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth, the lease, the commercial lease agreement that's been presented to us with the materials tonight. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I, I just did want to mention what the potential conflict is because if someone was wondering what it was, uh, I think it should be disclosed. Okay. Uh, the, the potential tenant is a t candidate for the town council, and that's the, the reason why uh, I did not participate. It just didn't seem appropriate at this time. Okay. Is there discussion? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mike. Moving on, the next item is item number 116, which was, has to do with the Conservation Commission. Jessica, did you want to uh, lead the discussion or make a motion on this one? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yes, you have before you the updated rules, uh, Commission Rules of Procedure. I would like to introduce uh, Marty Blair, who's in the audience. She is representing the Conservation Commission this evening. and. She might be available for any questions if we have them. <laughs> um, but pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. But this is in uh, an effort to be um, in compliance with the new communication policy within the town by the town council. So, okay. great. Thank you. Do you want a motion first, or do you want? Can we ask questions now? Or? Uh, why don't we have a motion first? Okay. Yes. May I? Yeah. Yes. I move that we accept the draft rules of procedure for the Conservation Commission's rules of procedure. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. David. I, I just had a question. Are, are all of the rules new, or was it the, the rules on public participation that were new? I, I, mean, I, re I read it all, but I, I was just curious about that. And, and if you're asking, Marty, if you could please come up to the uh, podium. Go ahead. Or, or, or if Jessica well, knows, Marty, you can Marty, deal with it. Be nice to have Marty. I just want to make sure that we have a microphone on you. <laughs> it's primarily what we've been working with before, but we are really um, grateful to the council. And last night at our meeting, people said, um, "Be sure that that was expressed. That you encouraged us to make room for public comment at our meetings, and um, encourage us." We had, we've had a public meeting about work that we're doing. Citizens have come to our meetings now. We've been much more open um, about publicizing when meetings are going to occur and having a time slot on our agendas for public comment. So I think it has worked the way you intended it to. And for that, we are great, very grateful. So did you have written rules before? Yes. Yeah. OK, so it's mostly what what we have before us, it's the addition of the public comment stuff. Of the communications with communications the public. Stuff. Yes. And I was going to say yes. That Yes. It's my understanding. There were, were rules already in place, but this was to add, uh, to enhance the communication policy with public um, input. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other um, discussion? I just wanted to say something quick. I wanted to thank Marty for her participation. For those of you who may not know, Marty is a recovering city administrator. <laughs> uh, served in a number of communities and uh, you know a few years ago she was the city administrator of Westbrook and we're very fortunate that she's volunteering her services uh, here in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you Marty. So I, I just wanted to commend the commission on the public comment section it seems although there are parameters it, it gives the commission a lot of flexibility in how they want to handle public comment depending on what issues come up and how many folks are there, et cetera. So I, I, these rules look very uh, workable uh, from my standpoint. Great. Any other? Jim. And again, I want to, I want to underscore what David just said, that I appreciate the, uh, the groups accepting the communication strategy, embracing it, and employing it as part of what you do. And I'm sure the citizens are all very appreciative of that as well. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor? 
Great, thank you. And please convey our thanks to, well, to you and to the rest of the commission, please. You guys do wonderful work for the community. Thank you. Um, moving on, item number 117, Open Space Management Committee update. Jessica, you have an update for us. Yes, thank you, Ann. Um, yes, you have before you um, the uh, draft outline, Open Space and Greenbelt Management Plan outline. Um, just a quick recap. Um, the uh, committee received its charge from the Town Council on April 12th. We had the first meeting on June 8th. We had a public forum on June 16th. Um, the commission, I mean, the committee has been meeting monthly. In August, we devoted uh, the Conservation Commission canceled this meeting. We devoted, devoted the entire evening to open space management. Um, <clears throat> The committee has been working regularly and has come up with this outline that you have before you this evening. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to field them. Uh, the intent of this was, as, as we were requested, to have a draft outline by September 30, and that was achieved. Um, the plan at this point is to then start writing the chapters. So that's where we are. Um, we, uh, we were originally charged to have that completed by December of this year. Um, I would like to request, if it's, I hope, the will of the council that we, we receive a six-month uh, extension. This, has, this is a, a great deal of work. And, um, and I am very pleased the committee has been working regularly uh, very hard on this. But it is quite comprehensive. So. Um, in, in addition to fielding any questions, I, I would like to, the council to entertain a six-month uh, extension for us on completion of this draft plan. So you're making that motion? Yes, I am. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Is there discussion or are there questions? I have a couple of questions. Sure. On the second page, um, sort of at the top of the page, it's under Roman numeral five, under property management and maintenance policies, A, town-wide property management policies, and then it has number 10, hunting, number 11, trapping, number 12, camping. I didn't know um, if these are just suggestions. Fishing, I want to add fishing to that list. Okay. And somewhere in here, you might want to have something about access to Great Pond, I thought. Because I think the Maine state law says that uh, if there's state mandated access to ponds over a certain acreage, and so you might want to have something in your open space report about that, because I think it's a state law that you have to allow access to okay. certain body, bodies ponds of, of certain acreage of a size. certain size. Okay. And I think Great Pond is the only one, I think, in our town that's it is. big enough to okay. qualify for that. Yeah. So those are a couple of things. But otherwise, I thought the outline looked extremely comprehensive. And so I will be supporting. Um, first of all, I want to thank you and the committee also for their work on this. And I will be supporting the motion to extend the deadline to finish the full report to June 30th, 2011. Isn't that right? 2011? Wouldn't that be six months after? Words? Yes? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And please convey our thanks to uh, the committee. I will. Thank Just. you. Okay. Um, item number 118, general assistance appendices. Mike? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ann. One of the uh, good services the Maine Municipal Association uh, provides for us every year is to update the appendices that uh, uh, accompany our general assistance ordinance. General assistance helps out needy uh, individuals and families in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, with, with basic needs such as housing, food, uh, water, you know, and the other important utilities. Uh, it is required that there be a public hearing on this each year, and I'd like to recommend that you schedule a public hearing for Monday, November 8th at 7.30 here at the Hall. Ms. Joy, your motion. 
I move that we schedule a public hearing on Monday, November the 8th. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the public hearing? Setting the date of, for the public hearing? It's unanimous. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, item number 119, the election warrant. Back to you, Jeb. Great, thank you very much. Uh, state law does require that the municipal officers um, approve the municipal election warrant. Again, we have a municipal election for council and school board. Two seats are available on each. We also have a Portland Water District Board of Trustees um, seat that's available for a five-year term. It calls for the election on Tuesday, November 2nd at the high school gymnasium, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. The polls are open. It also calls for the processing of absentee ballots. Um, on Monday, November 1st, we'll be conducting um, that process beginning at 9 a.m. here at Town Hall in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Um, again, absentee balloting uh, is going on. The Registrar of Voters is available during our office hours and on Election Day to uh, accept new registrations and corrections to the voting list. And to let you know also, the um, state law provides for the um, warrant for the state election, it's actually a notice of election that's signed by the town clerk now. Um, this warrant, uh, that notice of election and specimen ballots for all of these will be posted um, uh, more than seven days prior to the election. We're going to do that um, next week. And just so everybody knows, specimen ballots are on our website for both the state and municipal. I forgot to mention that before, if anyone wants to look at those. So I encourage the council. Um, to approve the warrant, and as always, we have on election day Sharon Gower serving as the warden, uh, Jacqueline Coy and myself as deputy wardens, and April Cohen Tracy as assistant town clerk. Okay, thank you very much. Do I hear a motion? So moved. <laughs> Second. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the warrant. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Awesome. Please convey our thanks to all your various workers. Okay, we have one additional item that um, was added to, uh, a little bit later uh, to the um, agenda tonight. Mike, do you want to address that? It's item number 120, having to do with a utility location permit. Yes, this is a utility location permit uh, near the intersection of Stonegate and Mitchell Road. Uh, what, what brings us about, it, this is Stonegate Road up at the, the Rockcrest section of Stonegate, uh, the, the part closer to the town center. And there was an old farmhouse on Mitchell Road owned by the Wabconishes, if I pronounce that right. Uh, they were able to subdivide the, the property into three lots without being required to go through the formal subdivision process because it was, it was that size subdivision. Uh, Central Maine Power has been working with the owner of the, the new owner of the property uh, to potentially to extend the utilities along Stonegate Road because even though they're not part of the Stonegate development as it originally existed, it would be served by, by Stonegate Road. Uh, the existing lines are already underground in that area. Uh, between, as you can see here, between uh, PM number 11 and poll number 57. Uh, and the, the only real change that anyone would see, other than the eventual uh, development of homes in that area, is a new pad uh, that would be installed about halfway between the two. And it, it, uh, that, would be, that would be the plan. So this is for the eventual development of two new homes potentially uh, on Stonegate Road uh, as part of the original Wovconish parcel on Mitchell Road. And, and could you explain what you mean by a pad? A, a pad that, a trans that a, one of these uh, electrical little boxes goes on. It's, you, they already exist in uh, Stonegate from okay. along the way. Okay. It's, you, you need to have one every so many feet when you, uh, in order to access power to serve different lots. I see. Um, is there a motion? 
David. I move that we approve Central Maine Power's request for an underground utility location permit on Stonegate Road as presented to us in our materials this evening. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I have a question. Um, we just paid Stonegate Road. Is that going to get? No, this is in that. It's going to be on. There's that little grassy esplanade that on the left -hand that side. the Stonegate developer actually put in. That's within the public right. This is within the public right of way, but it's in that grassy area that uh, I think Stonegate does just the maintain development okay. maintains it. Yeah. So it won't dig up it's the road. Dig up. It'll it'll dig up the public right of way. Not the in the road. grass here, not, not the, the road, really not the road. road that we just paid. No. So is that right near the, the sewer pump station there? Is it's it right before you get to it. If you, if you go in that road, Stonegate, you really don't notice it until you think about it. But until you get up around the corner past that pump station, there's no homes along there. And the reason Bob Taylor, when he did the Stonegate development, didn't put the homes there is he didn't own the property. It was owned by the, the old farmhouse uh, on Mitchell. So are and, he, the, and he also didn't provide that kind of protections to Stonegate Association that he probably should have at the time. That's why they can break into Stonegate Road as part of the address. Yeah. But it is what it is. I mean, it's yeah. you know, straightforward. Um, there is some off-site improvement inside the um, that this will um, this will affect, and I'm assuming that. Uh, Central Maine Power is going to dig that area that that all of that will be put back in place or whatever will be having assurances that it will be because that there is power to that corner where there are stone walls and a fence and they are probably in the right of way and of course they've been invested in over time by all Stone Gate residents. Yeah. They're, they're required to, we'll take photographs and they'll be required yeah. to put back in as is. And also significant plantings that were invested in as well. So. You know, I, I won't guarantee the exact same plantings, but uh, we'll we'll work with the various parties to ensure that uh, uh, everyone's happy. Upgrades will be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a great goal to have everyone happy. So. Okay. Other questions, concerns? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much. And that is the end of our numbered agenda. We have now the second, the second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. <laughs> Councilor Chairman, did you want to mention the uh, ordinance committee meeting on the 21st? Oh yeah, I should have mentioned that at the front end of the meeting. Uh, we are going to have an ordinance committee meeting on, at 7.30 in the morning on October 21st uh, to discuss the proposed ordinances relating to the, is it the PACE? PACE Weatherization Program. We weatherization Program. Uh, public is welcome to attend, and, uh, but it is 7.30 a.m., not p.m. And Mike, where's the location? Is it I, I didn't specifically double check to see if that room's available yet, but we're here in the town office. Okay. Okay. Um, there were no citizens in the chamber other than us, so they, no, nobody came forward to speak. Before we adjourn, I just want to mention um, the <coughs> ordinance committee meeting, but upcoming meetings of the town council include a workshop on pending issues November 1st and our regular town council meeting on November 8th. Uh, we will do council goal setting at a workshop on December 6th and then have our December regular meeting on the 13th of December. And don't forget, we have an election November 2nd. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? Can I ask a question? Yes, you That workshop, does that start at 7.30 or 7 o'clock? Which workshop? The... Pending issues? Yes. I believe it starts at 7.30. Okay. Some of ours have started at seven. I just want to make sure I had it right. Okay. Do we know the topic? Pending issues. We, Pending issues. Yeah, I, I haven't had a discussion with the council chair yet. I did with the ordinance committee uh, chair this morning when you kept <laughs> so asking the phone, is there anything else new? Uh, we were hoping the, the ordinance committee is, is prepared to recommend to the council uh, real prioritization of, of some of the work, uh, recommend the comprehensive plan. And it was felt it might be good to workshop that prior to the council meeting on the 8th. 
so that questions are, are asked and answered. Okay. Uh, and That's certainly a pending issue. And beyond that, just sort of a general overview of town goals, council goals. Uh, so far, I mean, the yep, current, the an current evaluation of progress. And so progress report. Yeah, um, and, and I, I recall there was a little bit more of the environmental goals that we're supposed to carry over into that meeting. Anyone okay. else remember that? I do. I could be wrong. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. When we, you know, when we talked about paper bag. Oh, right, right. right. We're all, we look, we're all we looking at each other. That was a huge miss of environmental issues. <laughs> yeah, okay. Paper bag. <laughs> Discussion of paper oh, bag and other environmental goals. Okay, glad you asked that question. Okay, um, so now do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous, so we are adjourned. Thank you very much.